Brother Farley came in on uh, Friday evening, and uh, he showed a video, I think it's about 11 minutes, he said, about what God is doing in the Philippines. The, the Philippines have has realized they, they have a, a drug epidemic. And uh, they, they had, um, well, what they did was the president there made it legal for police officers to shoot people if they were doing drugs. And how many lost their lives? Almost 5,000 5, were just shot dead. So they've had now over 1 million that have turned themselves into the government saying we're addicts, we want help. And the government doesn't know what to do with them. So they've appealed to the churches to say, help us. We don't know what to do with these people. We, we, can't, we can't help them. Help us help them. And that's where the RU Philippines was, uh, the RU Beyond, I think they call that, the Philippines ministry was, was launched. And uh, we helped uh, both the church and our Friday night class. Uh, six of those, I think, get started, $1,500, $250 to start a chapter in the Philippines, which is incredible. And uh, most of the churches there are good that have it, they're good folks, they just, they don't have much money uh, to be able to, to support something like that. But boy, they're, they're, God's impacting that, uh, that country in a real way. And it's exciting to hear. Well, I'm not gonna, he's gonna fill you in on that. We're gonna see the video, and then uh, he'll maybe take a minute and explain a few things to you, and uh, we'll just take maybe 15 minutes total if you take a few minutes after that video, and uh, we'll just kind of give you an update on what's going on there in the Philippines. Do you wanna do the video first? Do you want to say anything before that? No? Okay. You got it ready to go? Do you want to talk through it? Talk over? Yeah. Okay. All right, Brother Dean, you got that ready to roll? I go now. Uh, there it is. Brother Ben Burks and I from RU Recovery Ministries began receiving telephone calls from Filipino pastors concerning the war on drugs that is taking place in their country and the dilemma of. Uh, hundreds of thousands of drug addicts turning themselves in, seeking help, and even those in the government asking churches to come alongside and assist. About uh, more than 30 years ago, I came and visited you. And the Lord is very good because He blessed you. He gave you a ministry like this. He, 30 years ago, in 1984, I introduced a ministry in America. My burden is to reach my people. But lately, Dr. Kingsbury, there is an happening in the Philippines. 3.7 million people are involved in drug addiction. So, as of today, almost 700,000 people had surrendered to government people, the police, put their, put their finger to be, sign a document admitting that they are involved in drug addiction. And I think this is a blessing from the Lord because everybody are now aware of what's happening in the Philippines. 2,400 people had been killed in drug-related a killing and our president is committed in cleaning up the Philippines. The government don't know what to do because this is a phenomenon that suddenly 700,000 people surrendered for admitting that they are drug addicts, they are involved. We don't have, except the Bible, knowledge on how to deal with this problem. So suddenly I remember you, my brother. This is an urgent thing. So, uh, Dr. Paul, the reason why I am here is to ask the Christians in America to support this program so that you can go to the Philippines and help these people. I know we cannot help 3.7 million people, it's a lot of money, but at least by doing something, we will not be answerable to God and say, Lord, it's happening, but we are not doing anything. I think I cannot rest if we will not do something. And if I will not go to you and explain to you, you will not fully understand what we need in the Philippines. So, my brother, will you please tell your people in America 
to please, I plead with you, to please consider these people. Well, amen. And we're, we're glad that God brought you our way, Dr. Kizan. And I have no doubt that uh, this, this dilemma in the Philippines is God's opportunity for us to take the ministry of uh, the local church helping addicts through the program of RU and uh, reaching those addicts and assisting their families. And who knows the difference that this could make in, uh, in, the, in the world as this country faces this dilemma and implements biblical truth through local New Testament, Bible-believing churches and believers in those churches. And uh, we've calculated this out that uh, we can bring the complete curriculum, the materials, the training to the Philippines and institute it in a local independent Bible-believing church for about $250 for every church. And just within the sphere of, of relationships that you have, uh, that God's given to you over these three decades uh, there in the Philippines, that represents uh, more than 1,000 churches right there just through this, uh, particular, this brother's particular ministries that God has given to him there. And there are many others across the Philippines and others that uh, are coming alongside with us. And if you can help in any way uh, to implement this, and it's in a crisis. This is not something that we can wait and pray about for years and years. No, the need is now, and the opportunity has presented itself now. And that's why we're taking the initiative to let you know about this need and what we can do and what you can do to be a part of it. We're praying that God will allow us to take this message to the Philippines and help this dear country uh, with this need. If we can help clean the people in drug addiction in the Bible way, like what you're doing, we will be better off in the future. And the blessing is there is a golden opportunity to reach more people for Christ Amen. through this program. And I think this is our golden opportunity to do something Amen. for our people. We need your help to meet the needs of the 700,000 that are still alive, that needs to be, to be helped. will in the sound room just let that dvd go because right now at the end of this i have posted some pictures on here of the first seven conferences that we held the last week of november and the first week of december of last year we took a six-person team and went over and we trained about 540 chapters and uh, trained about uh, 5,000 people uh, workers and uh, pastors and you're going to see some of those pictures here in just a minute. The first place we were at was right here in Batangas. Uh, we trained about 120 there. That's Miss Wendy Burks, the wife of the international director, Ben Burks. That's Pastor Paul Kingsbury. He did a lot of preaching. All of us preached and taught a lot uh, while we were there. This is the Bethany Baptist Church. This is home of where my Southeast Asia RU office is. As a matter of fact, that's a photograph out across Manila taken from my office window. I absolutely have a beautiful scenery to look at and the city of Manila to pray over. This is the inside of Bethany where we held one of the conferences. Um, this is one side of the RU office. Uh, one of the projects I did the last time I was back was to get that office all set up. This is just a typical view down the street there in Manila. And this is one of the main mode of transportation, a little uh, motorcycle with a sidecar, and they'll cram about seven or eight people on one of those crazy little things. And this is a little church uh, that I preached at. This is actually the man that was in the um, video that's his son-in-law's church uh, this was a conference at, in Tarlock City where we had about 2,500 participants uh, a lot of Christian workers and and leaders there of course this is Dr. Kizan who I've known for many many years I met him when I was the youth pastor there at Grace Baptist Church in Delaware and I've known him for many many years uh, and I'm, I'm a giant over there I'm about six foot tall but over there I might as well be eight foot tall compared to them this was our three-person team there in Tarlock City. 
And this is one of the split sessions that I had the privilege of teaching there in Tarlock. And the Philippines just have such a sweet spirit, the folks do. This is one of the, re one of the registration tables. This is a bag of booklets. The um, $250 per chapter that you initiated allowed us to get those books printed, the curriculum printed and passed out. This was one of the sessions there at Bethany uh, Baptist Church back there in Makati City. This is Pastor Noble there on the left. Um, he is the Philippine pastor there at Bethany Baptist Church where I attend when I'm not traveling when I'm there in the Philippines. This is in Elo, Elo City. Dr. Rick Martin has a huge, tremendous work there. They have an orchestra of about 120, just absolutely fabulous. They run about 3,000 in their church on Sundays. But the exciting thing about this conference, so those are city officials in the black uniforms. They came to officially uh, thank us for being there and bringing, that's the uh, um, police commissioner there, thanking us for bringing the gospel and hope to their people. This was one of the first uh, surrenderies that uh, uh, was converted and saved. But the, at that conference, we actually had 200 of the surrenderies that were transported from jail to come and sit in on our conferences. And again, this is, this is one of the um, con, um, surrenderies that got saved and uh, God's restoring his family. And Dr. Martin there and Ben Burks, and we just had a great time of preaching the gospel. And uh, this is uh, Brother Ken Griffin. He's actually an assistant pastor, RU director, out in Pasco, Washington. He was one of the uh, men that went with us. Worse than being lost is being lost and no one to find you. That is a soul-winning slogan that they use at the Bible Baptist Church in Cebu. And this is uh, another split session I was teaching there in Cebu. This is Dr. DeSalva, 85 years old, still pastoring that church. A great, great work. Miss Wendy there again, uh, out preaching all of us men. Amen. Now, actually, ladies, she was just teaching a session. And this is the sign that's on my RU office door there. Again, another shot there at the RU office. And we just had a tremendous time. Another shot out across Manila. And I just thank the Lord for what he's doing in the Philippines. And Pateras Independent Baptist Church is one of the many churches that we uh, trained uh, while we were there. As a matter of fact, they were part of that Bethany conference right there that we're seeing there again, Pastor Noble. And uh, it's just an incredible uh, tricycles, uh, bicycles that they have a sidecar on. And the guys pedal you around the city. And it's amazing. That's a shot down the street from the um, sidewalk there in front of the office. This is uh, Pastor Mark Buxton, he has a work on the other side of Manila from where I'm at. He and his wife took Ben and Wendy and I to a big, huge mall. That was actually called the uh, Mall of Asia. It is the, actually the largest uh, mall uh, in Asia. And it, ladies, you would absolutely fall in love with it. It is about five stories tall. It covers three city blocks. You know how much shopping I did? I walked in, there was a Starbucks on the right. I went to Starbucks, got a coffee, sat down, and let the ladies shop for about three hours. And I was sitting in the same place when I came back. I saw a lot of the mall, amen? <laughs> but uh, seriously, I want to thank you, um, Pastor, for your dedication to the RU Recovery Ministry, for the privilege of being here Friday night. I just had an absolute blast with your folks here at the Friday night meeting. I'd ask you that you would pray for us. I'm continuing now back home here for a few, uh, few months uh, on the road traveling. Uh, trying to raise some more support. Not for me personally. I'm actually a printer by trade. I worked for the Columbus Dispatch for many, many years before God called me into the ministry. And in 2002, I uh, left, uh, resigned my position there at the dispatch and went full-time in the ministry. And that's where I first met Katie up at uh, Delaware, Ohio, Grace Baptist Church. And exciting for a youth pastor to come back into town and see some of his young people still serving the Lord. That's exciting. But uh, I'm excited that uh, what God is doing but I am uh, traveling and raising support, not for myself, but for our ministry, for the printing. Uh, as Pastor mentioned, those churches there, they're very, very poor, what we would call poor financially. And uh, they can't, they, to be honest, they can't afford, you have to fly everywhere you go in the Philippines. <coughs> Excuse me. They can't afford to fly me there and, and put me up in a hotel for a couple of days and hold conferences. And, and so we're really uh, just, we're doing this by faith. Um, I stepped out and I actually retired, left my assistant position job uh, the 1st of January in Ocala, Florida. And so now I'm officially unemployed and retired. Amen. But I'm traveling around uh, trying to do the work the Lord wants me to do there in the Philippines. So you pray for Tim Farley, are you beyond the ministry as we 
go back and we have, I spent the month, month of February uh, and three small conferences there, but concentrated on getting everything that I would need there in the Philippines set up in the office. I have the office set up so when I go back at the 1st of July, I can hit it, hit the uh, ground running, and I'm excited to see what God is going to continue to do in the Philippines. Again, Pastor, thank you so much for allowing me the time. Thank you. Well, it's been good to be in church tonight, hasn't it? <clears throat> we could have a prayer right now and go home. Now, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. But, uh, boy, I tell you what, my cup's full already. But take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, please. <clears throat> we're going to read the first 14 verses of Luke chapter 14. I'm going to begin on verse 1, then you'll join me on verse 2. I'll read verse 3. We'll alternate like that until we end together on verse 14 of Luke chapter 14. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or ox fall into a pit? And will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day. And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then see also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of the scripture here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already heard tonight. Lord, thank you for the wonderful music. Uh, uh, that only honors you, God, and Lord, it blesses our heart to sing the truths that we've sang about tonight. We love you. We thank you for the privilege to be here this evening. I pray, Lord, that you will put our heart to be in tune with your heart, that each of us has been prayed would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to his church this evening. Father, bless the special, and Lord, may it turn our focus and our attention to thee. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. There's a covenant sweet It was written for me It's a promise that I could be healed From all my sin and my shame even heartache and pain it was signed and confirmed on a hill so i rest 
my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied. Oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Don't feel sorry for me. When you see I'm in need, there's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts, all my sin he forgives, every trial is won through the blood. So I rest my case at the cross. For now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied, though I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Oh, I've been justified, satisfied, though I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Amen. Now, Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the, again the opportunity for us to be together here and to look into your word. Thank you for the Bible this evening. Lord, we're so thankful that we have your words in front of us tonight. Lord, I pray that each of us would give our careful attention now to the only book you've ever written. And Lord, I pray that the Word of God would be quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And I pray, God, that each of us would profit from the Word this evening because we'll mix it with faith as we hear it. And we will seek to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And so, Lord, help each of us these next few moments to give our full and undivided attention to your word and to the truth you have for us tonight. Please help me as I bring the message and help me to say what I ought to say and leave unsaid what doesn't need to be said. And, Lord, help me help the people to listen. And, Lord, may they hear exactly what the Spirit of God would have them to hear tonight. So we trust that your will will be accomplished in the next few moments that we spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I said this morning when I announced the subject of speaking about humility, that's a, that's a subject that is not easily spoken about. <clears throat> you don't, I don't, I don't been in a, a, a confession here this morning, tonight in the Baptist church, but I don't know the last time I was in a Christian bookstore, uh, but I, I would imagine there's not too many books on the shelf about humility. Uh, nobody writes a book, Humility and How I Obtained It. You know what I mean? You just, uh, it doesn't work, does it? And uh, I did read a story once about a little frog that wanted to go south for the winter. It was too far to hop, and so he didn't, and he obviously didn't have any wings to fly. And so he... He got his two friends, which were two birds, and together they came up with a plan. He said uh, if each of the birds would hold a twig, a stick in their beaks, and then all the frog had to do was clamp down on the middle and hold on. The two birds on the side would fly that frog south. Well, and he did. They got the sticks in their beaks, and he clamped on with his mouth, and they took off. Everything seemed to be going real well. They're flying through the air, and two farmers are in the field, and they look up and see this thing. Two birds flying with a frog hanging on to the stick. <clears throat> One farmer said to the other, boy, that was a brilliant idea. He said, man, I wonder who came up with that plan. And the frog said, I... All he had to do was keep his mouth shut. I read where the former heavyweight boxer James Quick Tillis, he was from Oklahoma, 
but he fought out of Chicago in the early 80s. He told the story of remembering arriving in Chicago from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said, my first day in Chicago, I got off the, the, the bus and in front of the Sears Tower in downtown Chicago. He said, I had two cardboard suitcases. He said, I, I set them down on the ground. And he said, I looked up at that big Sears Tower. And I said, he, he said, I'm going to conquer Chicago. He said, when I looked down, both my suitcases were gone. Or maybe it's like the preacher who received a Christmas card and a no, with a note in it from, his, from a lady in the congregation, Brother Ford. He said she was very complimentary about his preaching. In fact, compared him to Billy Graham. She finished by writing, I think you're one of the truly great preachers of our time. And later that day, he showed the note to his wife. And she said, well, who is this woman? And he said, well, she's obviously a very intelligent woman in the congregation who loves good preaching. And then he looked at his wife and he said, you know, how many great preachers do you suppose there really are in the world? And his wife very wisely looked at him and said, one less than you think. <laughs> Tony Campalo, is that how you say his name? I know he writes books. He said this, and this is sobering thought. He said, if you ever start to feel proud, just remember that soon after your body's been lowered into the grave, your family and friends are going to be eating potato salad and telling jokes, and you'll be history. That kind of hurts, but that's true. Charles Spurgeon said, the demon of pride was born with us. And it will not die one hour before us. It is so woven into the warp and woof of our nature that until we are wrapped in our winding sheets, we will never hear the last of it. Someone said pride or the worship of self is the religion of hell. So true. Now, it's difficult, I think, to <clears throat> grasp a definition of humility. But if you had to try to put a definition on it, I think you could say it's choosing to put others ahead of yourself. That's certainly humility. It is putting yourself in submission to God. That is humility. Not putting yourself as the throne on the throne of your heart, but putting God on the throne of your heart. And you can't be in submission to God and in submission to yourself. You cannot serve two masters. There's many promises in the Bible to those who will be humble. Proverbs 29, 23 says, A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Isaiah 57, 15, Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell with the, in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite, and humble spirit. Micah 6, 8, He has showed thee, O man, what, doth the, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. James 4, and verse 6, He giveth more grace, wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. James 4.10 Peter, in 1 Peter 5, verse 5, says, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. I think it's, it's interesting that God would give Peter those words to write, isn't it? <laughs> so while I think humility may be difficult for us to just come up with a definition to say, okay, if I just, if I just did this or did that, I think, I think what we find are some characteristics of what humility looks like. 
I, I don't know that you can ever look at your life and, and then come to the, to the conclusion, yeah, I'm a humble person. Because that's a proud statement in itself. I think truth, truthfully, the, the humblest person in the room tonight does not know it. Is not aware of it. Because humility isn't just thinking little of yourself. It really isn't thinking of yourself at all. And so you don't have any idea. And you won't know till you get to heaven. But let's, I think in Luke 14, if your Bible's still open there, what we see here in this passage is we see some characteristics of humility. Uh, both before and after, it all hinges, I think, around verse number 11, where Jesus says, Whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I think all this surrounding this deals with humility. And the Lord Jesus is going to teach us here, I think, characteristics of a humble person. And I just want to share four of them with you tonight from this passage. Number one, <clears throat> a humble person cares about people in need. One of the first ways you can tell if you have humility is this. Am I focused on my needs or on the needs of others? What am I focused on? Some of you in the church, some of you won't know who I'm talking about, some of you will. <clears throat> we had two wonderful ladies in our church when I came here, and um, Carolyn Richardson and Marietta Kaufman, and uh, two, two delightful uh, ladies, and they, they died not too far apart in 2009, uh, one in August and the other the first of November. And I'll never forget, these two ladies, been in this church for years and years and years, and and servants of the Lord. In fact, Marietta's husband built this building that we're in. He was a general contractor. They, back in those days, in 2009, the ladies did Secret Sisters. You familiar with that thing? It's, it's kind of where you do something nice for another lady, and they don't know who's doing it. Uh, at the end of the year, you kind of reveal who your secret sister was. But the idea was each month, you do something for them. You get them a little gift, you write them a note, you do something for them. And <clears throat> both of those ladies, both August and November, though they passed away, what they found when they went in and looked through their belongings was each of those ladies had all their gifts for the remainder of the year for their secret sister, including the Christmas gifts. Already set, <clears throat> already marked, labeled, so everybody knew what they were for. In other words, though, though they were in their last days, and though they could have been focused on themselves, they still focused on others. They still thought about their secret sister, thought about others' needs more than their own needs. What Jesus says here, notice the first few verses of Luke 14. He's invited to one of the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread, and it's the Sabbath day. And notice the last phrase of verse 1, they watched him. You know what that means? It was a trap. <clears throat> they wanted him in for a meal, but they wanted in to try to trick him. They watched him. That means they were, they were waiting to try to trip him up on something. Okay? And uh, some of you understand how that is. You may work in an environment where they're watching you all the time. And they're, they're waiting for you to say something you shouldn't say or listen to something you shouldn't or laugh at something you shouldn't have laughed at and them to say, Hey, hey, I thought you were a Christian. What are you doing? And they're watching. And they're watching for Jesus. And here's what happened. A certain man had the dropsy, they call it. And the dropsy is a word. It, it really is a word. We get our word. It's hydro. It's where we get our word water from. This fellow had a water problem. I think they call it edema or edema. Does that sound familiar? And uh, it's, it'd be similar to that today. And, and they're watching Jesus to see what he's going to do with this fellow. I'm sure they put him there. I'm sure they wanted to see. Because here's the thing. If, if he does something for, for him on the Sabbath, they'll call Jesus a lawbreaker. If he doesn't do anything, they'll say he lacks compassion. He doesn't care about people. How are you going to win? They're watching him. And so how could he possibly be the Messiah if he doesn't have any compassion? And how can he possibly be the Messiah if he's a lawbreaker? He can't be. And so they thought they, they have him. And so, until Jesus asked them this question, 
He said, what would you do if you had one of your animals fall into a pit on the Sabbath day? Would you rescue them? Well, now they don't want to answer them because they know the answer is going to going to be they're going to incriminate themselves absolutely they would get their animal out of the pit even though it was the sabbath day and that was allowed that was okay certainly was and so they knew the answer would they would help their beast out and so jesus healed the man that day listen knowing he'd be criticized knowing that they would come after him knowing that he was being watched well, why would he do that? Because he thought more of this man's need than his own. He was more concerned about this man being healed than what people would say about him. Boy, it's a great day when what consumes you is what, but first of all, what God thinks about you rather than what other people think about you. And then secondly, when you are concerned about the needs of others above your own needs. Where you're concerned that you'll help somebody else regardless of what people may think about you and say about you. Ask yourself this question tonight. What percentage of my time is spent caring for my needs and what percentage of my time is spent caring for the needs of others? The old songwriter said, Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, that I may live for others, that I may live like Thee. Living for others. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, that's the first and greatest commandment. But the second is like unto it, that is, love thy neighbor as thyself. Caring for the needs of others ahead of your own, that's humility. You care about people in need. Number two, this is in the second part of the chapter here, verses 8 through 11. A humble person will let others go ahead of him. You could say he'll... He'll in honor prefer others before himself. Notice verse 8, he gives here the illustration of the wedding. And he says, Sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him, and he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. <clears throat> See, the, the scene he's describing here is a wedding. And in... In, in the wedding, the place of honor was at the front, unlike church. <laughs> Where everybody thinks the place of honor is the far back as you can get, you know. <laughs> place of honor is the front, amen, Brother Burns? Yeah, there he is, amen. If you took of honor, but if you took the seat of honor and someone who was more important than you came in, you would have to, in shame, be moved to a lower spot and they would take your place how embarrassing is is that it'd be like you coming to a wedding in the united states and you know there's a reception afterwards and they have what they call the head table for the wedding party and you walk in and sit down at the head table but it isn't your wedding and you're not in the party and someone would have to politely come up to you and say uh, excuse me Brother Taylor, you, this is for the wedding part. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. Did I say your name? I'm sorry, Don. No. And uh, you have to, you have to, you know, you need to come over here. And he would be embarrassed. Now, if he's with his wife, that would never happen. She would prevent that. Amen. But uh, you know, you, 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 and that's why we have wives to keep us out of those situations. Amen, fellas. But we, <clears throat> you, you understand the the embarrassment it was. So what he's saying is. Listen, he's not just talking about when you go to a wedding. He's talking about how you position yourself in life. How you handle yourself in everyday life. And that is, where do you position yourself in life? How about the back of the line? How about, how about uh, near the bottom? How about the less important place? Hmm? You see, he said, whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, shall be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. 
That means raised to a lofty height. The Lord will lift you up. If the Lord lifts you up, He lifts you much higher than you'd ever lift yourself. Than you ever could ever lift yourself. And I know that sounds crazy to us. That sounds crazy to people who don't know Christ. Who will not, by faith, live the Bible. You say, Pastor, you can't live that way. I've talked to men in business and they say, Well, Pastor, that's... That's church and that's Christianity, but that's not business. I said, my friend, Christianity is business too. Christianity is how you live every single day of the week, every hour of every day. Don't think, no, nah, preacher, you've got you to gotta push ahead of others or you'll end up behind. You, gotta, you, gotta, you, you put others ahead of yourself and you're going to end up at the end. Nice guys, finish last. No, 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 no. Dog eat dog. Eat or be eaten. Fight and claw and scratch. I know that's what the world says, and I know that's the philosophy that's out there, but what you have to decide is this. Okay, are they right, or is Jesus right? Who's right? Who am I going to believe? Who am I going to follow? And if I really want to be humble in the sight of God, Jesus is right. And the world is wrong. And I will put others ahead of myself. I, I enjoyed for years Zig Ziglar. I enjoyed his talks and his motivational speaker, speaking and such. And I'll never forget him saying, you'll, you'll, you'll get what you want when you spend your time helping other people get what they want. You spend your time helping other people get what they want. And you'll get what you want. That's a true statement. Care about people in need. Let other people go ahead of you. In other words, in honor, prefer somebody else. And then number three, we see the humble person gives without thought of return. Notice verse 12. Then he said also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. So he's did, helping us understand something here. When you make her a dinner or a supper, you know who you invite? People who can never invite you back. Those, church, those who lack humility are always looking for something in return. Those who lack humility are always looking for something in return. What's in it for me? And it, it may be reward. It may just be thanks. You ever do something for somebody and then you stop and think, they never even said thank you. I think you should. I think you ought to express gratitude when somebody does something for you. I think it's right to write a note of appreciation and say thank you. But if you don't do that, that isn't why you do it. If you don't receive that, that doesn't matter. If you get offended by that, it reveals your motive in wanting to do that. You give without thought of return. In our you, we, the definition of love is that willing, sacrificial giving of yourself for the benefit of others with no thought of return. You willingly and sacrificially give for somebody else or for someone else and you're not thinking about what will they do for me? What's in it for me? You see, it's not, the humble person doesn't say, okay, I'll scratch your back, but you scratch mine. The humble person doesn't say, yeah, I guess we better have them over. They had us over last time keeping the scoreboard. No, what the Lord is saying, it, the humble person will invite people over to his home who could never invite them over to their home. Could never ever uh, give a recompense. The humble person gives with a, a pure heart and a pure motive and does not want or expect anything in return. Are you humble? Do you, 
Do you send out a Christmas card and, and if you don't get a Christmas card back from everybody on your list, you start crossing them off for next year? Say, well, they don't get one from me next year. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I, got them a Christmas, I got them a birthday gift. They didn't give me anything for my birthday. Not giving them anything next year. We got, got into meddling there a little bit, didn't we? <laughs> All right, I'll buy lunch this time, but your turn next time. You help others, but you expect them to help you later when you need it. I've listened to people and... And, and say, you know, and, and they're upset. And I say, what are you upset about? Well, man, I help people all the time. I'm always there for them when they need it. And now when I need it, nobody wants to help me. That's not a humble person talking. That's somebody who says, yeah, I help everybody because I expect them to help me when I need it. Humble people give without thought of return. Humility. Humility. Remember this. The humble person loves to give. The proud person loves to get. Oh, I, I'll do it, but boy, somebody better recognize me. Somebody better, pastor better say, tell everybody what I did. Or, or well, he, he said those three names, and he didn't call my name, and I was there. In fact, I did more of those other guys altogether. You see how quick our pride can get there? We're all that way. That's, that's where you have, to, you have to die to yourself. That's where you'd be in submission to God. And the reason, the reason you care about others, you, you let others go ahead of you, you give without thought of return. You know why? Because of number four. Because of number four. Here's number four. You trust God for your rewards. You trust God for your rewards. Notice what he said. Verse 13, When thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed. But wait, when? Well, they can't recompense thee. It's not from people. Thou shalt be recompensed, rewarded, blessed at the resurrection of the just. Hey, it, you don't get, you don't get, if you want to get rewarded now, you can, but if you get rewarded now, you may not have a reward then. Would you want the reward from people now or would you want the reward from your Lord when you get to heaven? I'd sure rather have Jesus' reward, wouldn't you? You see, we trust God for the rewards. That's really how the other three work. If you're, if you're planning on, on caring for the needs of others and putting on honor, preferring someone ahead of yourself and giving with no thought of return, thinking that it's all, it's all good now, you may become discouraged. But you see, we're not living for now. I'm living for then. I'm living for when the day comes when I stand before the Lord and I give an account for the things done in my body, whether they be good or bad. I mean, if you don't live with eternity in mind and you just try to live those three principles, those first three we talked about, you know what? You could end up broke, unappreciated, and not have anywhere to sit when you go to a wedding. Okay? You could be in problem. If you believe this life is all there is, you'll go crazy trying to be a humble person. That's why there's so few of them in the world. If, if all there is is this life, then the teachings that, the teaching that we're just reading about in Luke 14, that's crazy. Because I, I better get ahead while I can. Because this is all there is. You better climb to the top. The good news is, this is not all there is. There's, there's, there's a life after this one. See, if this life is all there is, it's important the titles we hold, the positions we attain, the dollars we earn, and the recognition we receive. 
Now all that becomes so important. But what if the real rewards don't come now? They come later. Hmm? What if the real rewards don't come from men, they come from God? Then humility is essential. It's right. In fact, it's desirable. There's a bicycle race in India where the winning rider is the one who travels the shortest distance without touching the ground and without falling off. Think about that. The starter fires the gun, the crowd cheers and goes crazy, and all the bicycles barely move. They're just trying to hold their balance, go as short a distance as they can without falling off. Each cyclist doing his best to just, just inch ahead as little as he can just to maintain his balance. And when the, when the time was up, the cyclist who went the furthest lost. The one who went the least won. The winning strategy in our race is to care for the needs of others. It's to on honor prefer somebody else ahead of us. It's to give without thinking of anything in return. And you'll be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. You'll be recompensed at the judgment seat of Christ for the things done in your body. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Ever think about, listen, and the goal, you know what the goal is. The goal is never humility. The goal is to be like Jesus. And he was humble. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He said, I could call 12 legions of angels right now and take care of this whole thing. But he humbly submitted to the will of God. We're to be like Christ. That's all. Just be like Jesus. And so, humility. Humility. Let's, if we humble ourselves under the hand of God, He doesn't have to humble you. You humble yourself. And, and maybe, maybe a, a barometer a little bit, maybe to look at these four characteristics occasionally in your life. Say, am I, am I focused more on the needs of others than mine? Am I in honor preferring someone else ahead of me? Think about that next time you're driving in Columbus. Am I honor preferring someone else? You know, when you care about others' needs, when you, when you give and don't think anything in return, don't desire anything in return, when you live that way, guess what? You're living like Christ. Because that's exactly how He lived. He that humbleth himself, or exalteth himself, shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Humility. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your teaching here in Luke 14, teaching us about humility. Not an easy thing, Lord. We're proud creatures. We have that evil, and I mean it's evil pride. That I gets in the way so often. Well, so often we're controlled by what we want, what we think, and what we feel instead of what you want, what you think, and what you feel. And so if humility is not only putting others ahead of us, but living in submission to God, I pray that many in the room tonight, we would willingly, gladly, 
humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We'll not worry about promoting ourselves or lifting up ourselves, trying to pat ourselves on the back. We'll allow you to do that. Allow these characteristics of humility. Help us to be humble people. Help us to be like Christ. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many folks tonight would just say, Pastor, the Lord has dealt with my heart tonight about the characteristics of humility, being a humble person. And I really want God to cultivate these in my life. I don't want, I don't want to be ruled by pride all the promises of the grace to the humble and God walking with the humble humbly walk with thy God say I want that humility I want Christ like humility to be a characteristic of my life and I will ask God to help me with that on a daily basis pastor pray for me this evening would you slip your hand up Christian yes amen that's good. You may put them down. I'm going to pray and we'll have our invitation. God has dealt with your heart tonight. Just respond to him. The altar will be open for you to pray. If you're here tonight and you never received Christ as your Savior, when others are coming to pray, why don't you come? And... We'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. If you've never been baptized, come and say, I need to obey the Lord and be baptized. I'm saved, but I'm not baptized. Maybe you're saved and baptized and you believe this is where you ought to belong. If the Lord has led you to come and be part of our church, then we want you to come tonight. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about, obey Him this evening. Heavenly Father, thank you for dealing with our hearts just tonight. And Lord, I pray now that each of us would humble ourselves and bow the knee to you and ask you to accomplish in each one of our hearts and lives whatever you desire. That we'll be in submission to whatever you want to do in us and through us and to us. Have your way in every heart, please. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, pianist will play as she plays by the Bible sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you please? All to Jesus I surrender. Right. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender Savior, I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. 
look this way for a minute, would you please? Brother Ford, you know uh, Dr. Clarence Sexton. Figured you might. You know, years ago, 20, 20 years ago now, I was at a pastor's meeting where the pastor was introducing him as the speaker. And he was waxing pretty eloquent about Dr. Sexton. He was sitting on the front row with his wife. And he told this when he got up. He said, I leaned over to my wife and I said, do you think he really believes all those things he's saying about me? <laughs> he's laying on pretty thick, you know. And his wife looked over at him and said, Clarence, it's okay if he believes those things. Just don't you believe them. Hmm? Pretty good advice, isn't it? And uh, one of the, don't, it's so, I know Mark Twain said, I can live two weeks on a good compliment. And uh, that's okay to compliment somebody and uh, do good to them when it's in your power to do good. But you know what? Don't, as they say, don't let it go to your head. Give the glory to God. Give the praise to him. If there weren't anything good about any of us, it's because of God. If it weren't for him, we're all a bunch of dirt bags. Okay? And so let's just give God the glory and let's stay humble. Amen? Let's be humble people. Humility. All right. Hey, um, Nikki is getting everything out of their townhome. And uh, a lot has been done. But the finishing touches are this Saturday, April 8th. Uh, she's going to need some help for a few hours from like 9 to noon this Saturday, April 8th. Uh, she needs some, some people, men with a truck. Brother Taylor, are you available? You have a truck in your trailer this Saturday from 9 to noon? Yes. yes? Okay. And uh, Brother Pete, is your truck available then? Uh, I'm sorry, not. You are not. I'm sorry, okay. That's all right. That's okay. All right. If anybody else has a truck and you can help, that will be a blessing. Uh, we need some muscle. Okay. So uh, if you can carry some boxes and I think they have a couch and such uh, that, that need to be carried out and put in storage uh, they could use some help is anybody with muscles available there's a muscle guy all right you got muscles Alan huh skinny guy like you come on all right you're young that counts we'll take you all right all right it can be uh, you want ladies with muscles you want to volunteer <laughs> take wherever we can get amen so uh, if you can help out even if it's for an hour or so it really will help if you don't stay the whole time that's fine and then we need ladies who kind of will help clean it will really help if we had a lady could just take each room you know what I mean and then it'll be done just like that and I know she really would appreciate your help we would too and uh, so if you can see Nikki would you let her know that you can help and what uh, what time you'll be there or whatever and uh, then she'll have an idea of how many are coming and that'll help us plan, okay? All right, we good? Don't look at me. Say something. Yep. But we good, and everybody look. Huh? Wake up, man. All right? You're about to wake up. Church is over. You're going to go eat somewhere. You know what I mean? You're awake. All right, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, it's been a good day in the house of the Lord. Thank you for... Bible Baptist Church, thank you for what you're doing here in our midst. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that's ours to serve you. Lord, help us to be a lighthouse for you in this area. And then throughout our state and then in our country and throughout the world. Thank you for Brother Farley. Thank you for Brother Ford. Thank you for the ministries they represent that literally go around the world. Thank you for allowing us to be a part in your great work that you're doing all over our globe. And Father, we love you this evening, and I, I pray, God, you'll dismiss us with your care. Lord, I pray that we'll be mindful of what we heard today. Help us to leave today having forgiveness in our heart as a way of our life, having faith in God, that, Lord, we'll always look to you, and our faith will be in you to take care of any difficulty, any problem, anything we face in life and Lord help us to be humble and to put others and their needs and your will ahead of our will we love you tonight thank you for a wonderful day with the people of God in Jesus name amen amen, amen. it's a grand thing to be a Christian 
It's the best thing I know. Let's sing it together, shall we? Let's hear you sing. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.